Hi there and welcome to lecture 7 for Biostat. So today we're looking at the linear model, um, which is essentially the way that we model a continuous outcome variable using um, one or more predictive variables or one or more sort of input variables. And so we're going to be looking at what makes up the linear model today and we're going to be looking at how we fit them in our studio, um, how we can use the linear model for prediction and then we're going to look a little bit about the um, assumptions that we're that, that we use when we're fitting a linear model and what it means perhaps when they're a little bit broken and how we can assess whether those assumptions are true or not. So you remember we had the um, example of Moroccan donkeys, right, where we have um, 385 donkeys from Morocco and we're wanting to estimate the body weight. Okay, so we, wanna, we want a procedure that we can use in the field in order to estimate what the body weight is without actually having to weigh the donkey. So what we're going to do is we're going to take measurements that are easy to use or easy to measure, such as the, the girth of the animal, the length, the height, and so on, uh, the sex perhaps, and we're going to use those um, with an equation to predict the body weight. And so the goal is to estimate that equation from a set of known donkeys where we know what the outcome weight, um, weight is. So we've, uh, we've you know, weighed each of the donkeys. We've also measured them in the ways that are easy to measure. And the idea is we can use those to build the the, um, the link between body weight and those predictive variables and we're going to then use that to predict the body weight. So we're going to start really simply with just a single predictor um, for body weight in terms of the heart girth. Okay, so that's the um, measured around the donkey, um, the girth of the donkey at uh, where its heart is. And we see there's a nice increasing trend, right? So, um, you know, donkeys with small heart girths have small weight, donkeys with large heart girths have large weights and it's reasonably a straight line relationship, and there's not too much scatter around that line, okay? So when we're building a linear model is we're trying to explain the variation in one measurement, such as the body weight, and to using other measurements, such as the heart girth. So the key idea is that we're modeling the average of one variable, so the average of body weight, conditional on knowing the values of the other variables. So given that we know the values of heart girth, what would we expect the average body weight to be? Okay, and so the model is for the average. Okay, and there's going to be scatter around that average, um, but we can use the average part of the model for the prediction of what the average would be, and then we can use our quantification of how much scatter there is to predict what the, what the range of individuals might be. And we saw that a little bit in the lab, didn't we? So the idea is that the straight line uh, that we're going to fit, the linear model, is an estimate of what the mean body weight is for a given heart girth. And we're, we assume that that, that that mean shifts using a straight line relationship like we have here. Right? So this line describes the average body weight for a given heart girth. So for 100, we're estimating that the average body weight is about uh, 90. Uh, for 130, we're estimating the average body weight is about 175. Okay, so the line describes the average body weight as we move. And so that describes the, um, the variation in the average body weight that we can explain using heart girth, right? So the, the shifting up and down the line is changing the body weight, changing the average body weight as we change the heart girth. So that's variation that we can explain using the linear relationship, using the model. But there's lots of scatter around the line, which is the, the variation of the individuals around the line, that is not explained, right? So for a given heart girth, there's lots of different possibilities for the body weight. We're only explaining the average. We're not explaining the individuals. So that's the variation in body weight not explained. There's a scatter around it. And a good model will be able to explain most of the variation in body weight by explaining the variation in the mean, right? So that would be one where there's not too much scatter around the, the trend line, okay? So some, some sort of um, definitions or, or of some uh, terms that you need to know. Uh, I've already been using some of these, the response variable is, the, is essentially the, the, the variable that we want to model. So that's usually represented by the Y variable. So in this case, it's body weight, right? That's the thing that we want to predict, the thing that is uh, most likely to be unknown. Sometimes called the dependent variable because it depends on the others, okay? Uh, the explanatory variables, predictors, covariates, or independent variables. 
they're all of the things that we're using to explain the response. So they're all the x variables. And um, in the first examples that we'll be looking at, they're all numeric measures. So for example, heart girth, right, is, is numeric. Okay, but later on we'll see how we can we can also use uh, categorical variables for this as well. Then the regression line or the linear model is the, is the functional form, the equation if you like, that relates the y to the x. But it also um, describes a little bit more than that. Um, it, so we have a functional form for the mean, okay, such as down here. But the linear model also has some um, information in it about how we expect the, the scatter of y about the mean to be as well. So we, we're going to assume that um, the scatter about the mean is a normal distribution, for example. Okay, so this is the form. We've got some, some x variable, which we multiply by a constant, which is the gradient or slope, and then we add on an, an intercept. So you might have seen this as um, a plus bx, or alpha plus beta x, or mx plus c. It's all the same, right? So m corresponds to the beta here. C corresponds to the alpha, the intercept. Depends on, you know, uh, when you when you first saw regression basically or when you first saw the equation of a line um you know what form that, that took so some people use mx plus c and that's fine nothing wrong with that okay so if you've got a line fitting through some data then the um the two um parameters the alpha and the beta um the beta is the is the slope it's essentially it's how far up you go for every unit increase across Okay, so it's how many kilos the body weight increases for every one increase in the, in, in, in the heart girth um, by a centimetre. So that's what the beta represents, the slope, and the alpha uh, represents the intercept. That represents the value that y takes when x is zero. Okay, so if you think about it for the heart girth example, that would be the weight that the donkey takes when the heart girth is zero. So in that example, it's kind of silly. It's a silly number, right? It's completely meaningless. Um, because, of course, you can't have a donkey with heart girth zero. Um, and that's just because the, the value zero is far away from the plausible values for heart girth. For some other examples that we'll look at, um, the intercept value, the alpha, is actually really, really important because it represents um, part of our data that's important. Okay, um, so for example, um, perhaps when, when we're looking at um, uh, a lamb's growing, right, um, and we have, uh, say, uh, uh, the age on the x-axis, then age zero represents birth, right? So the alpha would represent their birth weight. So it's meaningful in that context. And you'll see a bunch of other contexts where it's meaningful as well. Essentially, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's only um, not meaningful as a number when, um, the, when zero for the numeric variables makes no sense. Okay, so if zero for the numeric variables doesn't make sense, it's not a you know part of your data, then in that case the, the intercept is kind of a meaningless value. It's just a, sort of a place to start. It just tells you where to start your drawing your line from, basically. Okay, so the alpha and beta are coefficients of the model. Okay, and they're the things that we need to need to, to estimate using a set of data, right? Once we've if we've got a set of data relating the body weight to the heart girth then we can estimate those, um, what the alpha and beta are, and then we can use the alpha and beta for other thing, other donkeys that we haven't measured, right, just by putting the heart girth into that equation, like we saw in lab seven. Okay, and the, and the key thing to remember, just like in all statistics, is that the alpha and beta are estimated from a sample, right, they're not, they're not known from the population, that's the whole point of taking a sample and, and estimating them, Right, we don't know what the relationship is, so we take a sample, we estimate these things, and therefore our the, the sample statistics and they're, and they're going to have some uncertainty associated with them. So we'll be estimating what they are, we'll be you know writing down what the values are, what our best guess at those values are, which is called a point estimate, uh, but we'll also be noting down what the uncertainty in those values are, so that we can perhaps give a confidence interval for them. Okay, so how do we estimate these parameters? Well, um, the thing to remember is that every point is a pair of coordinates, right? Uh, for every donkey, we've measured their heart girth and their body weight, right? So it's a pair of coordinates, and I'm going to label them y sub i and x sub i. It just means that, you know, you've got x1 through x100 or whatever, okay? Well, for the donkeys, you'll have, you know, heart girth 1 through through to <coughs> the measure of heart girth um, 385 or whatever it is, right? Um then we're going to fit a line through that data and there's going to be a corresponding point on the line 
which is our which is the sort of the average um, body weight for that donkey and um, which we're going to be called y hat i okay so that would be our best guess given the line so the coordinates of this point would be x i y i hat okay and then there's, there'll be a difference between our estimate from our model the point on the line and the actual point right so that's going to be our error term which is sometimes um, we use this uh, epsilon i or you can use e if you like right it's just error that's all that that, that term represents and the idea is that we want to find the best slope and intercept by minimizing the amount of error that we get right we want the smallest possible error and we do that by making sure that the average error is zero so that means that the sort of we have the same distance of error on the above the line as we do below the line right so if you add all the errors up they should come to zero they should balance out right because the errors above the line will be positive and the errors below the line will be negative so they should balance out and the other thing we want to we want to uh, minimize is that the variation of the epsilon is as small as possible okay so we we minimize the variance of the residuals okay and this is sometimes called least squares estimation as if you write down what the formula for variance is you remember that from a few slides ago um, then it it represents a square right it's got a you know the variance is the mean square um, distance of each observation from the from the mean um, and the observation distance from the observations to the mean is epsilon i so it's the sum of epsilon i squared and so we're trying to minimize this ex this expression which is a sum of squares that's where the least squares comes from you don't need to know the formulas the the computer is going to do this for us right so the computer takes this formula with all the with all the yi's and the xi's and it finds the alphas and betas that makes this this quantity as small as possible okay so it minimizes the residual variance and uh, so the alpha and beta that we get out of the, this minimization is known as our least squares estimate because it minimizes the, the sum of squares. Now these are just estimates from a sample. So sometimes we will put little hats on them, alpha hat and beta hat, just to remind us that they're not the truth. Right? They're not the true values of alpha and beta from the population. They're just the values that we got from our sample and we're going to have some uncertainty associated with those. So this is the process, right? So we've got a bunch of points here. And I've just fit a flat line through here, which is clearly not a very good fit, right? And then I've drawn the um, the errors, right? The residuals. Um, the red ones are longer, and the grey coloured ones are shorter, right? So you can imagine these has been stretched out. And all we're going to do is sort of um, release the rubber bands, if you like. We've got rubber bands tying it to the line, okay? And we allow the line to sort of ping. And what that will do is reduce the, the residual variation. So you can see that as I increase the slope, the residual variation here is getting smaller, right? I start with, you know, almost 30. And as I increase the slope, that re residual variance drops away. And I'm getting a better and better fit. And it keeps going down until at some point it starts going back up again. All right, so we start getting a worse fit. So there's some sweet spot between a bad fit where the slope's too big and a bad fit where the slope's too small, somewhere in the middle. Okay, and that's just the the one that um, minimizes the the residuals of uh, the variation of the residuals, and that's just the that's just the uh, the variation that's not explained, right? It's just the scatter of the points around the line. The variation explained is the is the average trend, right? So we know that when when x is small, we're down here, and when y, uh, x is large, we're up here. So that's explaining a lot of the spread in y. But all of the scatter around the line is unexplained. So what we're doing in this process is we're maximizing the amount that we explain by the model by minimizing the amount that's unexplained. Okay. Now, the computer will do this for us, right? It'll compute that optimal slope and everything for us. And so it's done with the um, LM function in... Um, our studio so we've seen this before and what that does is that fits the linear model it estimates what those alpha and beta values are it computes what the uncertainty is and does a bunch of other stuff and then we can summarize it with a summary command right so mod here is an object is a linear model object that contains all the information about that model fit 
and we can do various things with that uh, model object that we'll look at later and one of the things we can do is summarize it with a summary command the name mod is just arbitrary right i could i could put jonathan here if i wanted to right or fred or something right it's just a name that i can then use later okay so when you run that line you'll get an object mod in your r studio environment that you can then reuse later on such as to compute the summary so here's what the summary gives us which is a lot of stuff and some of it isn't particularly useful so the things that i find useful are the very first bit that tells me what the model is and this is useful later because i'm very bad at naming things so you can see you know i called this model mod and later on we'll be fitting more than one model to a set of data right we'll be trying different models out to try and find kind of the the, the one that explains the most if you like or the one that gives us um, the most um, useful information so we're likely to have lots of different mods about and i name them mod mod 2 mod 3 mod 4 and i can never remember which is which so it's useful when you just do the summary to know which model you're looking at so that's what this one is so we're looking at the model of body weight described in terms of heart youth okay this next block of residuals is kind of useless um, because it just depends on the scale of the data okay and if you change the scale of the y variable then all these numbers will change so it's not all that useful okay and um, the block that is useful is this block here so this is telling us what our coefficients are what our alpha and beta are so the intercept term that's our alpha um, the important um, values here are the estimate of what it is right so it's saying that we think that alpha is minus 194.5 and we think that beta the thing that we multiply heart girth by is 2.83 Okay, so the equation here would be minus 194.5 plus 2.83 times heart girth. Okay, so that's what those two numbers there are. So that's what gives you your equation. But then we recognize that these things come from a population, right? This is a sample from a population, so there's going to be some uncertainty associated with these due to the sampling process, right? We take a different sample, we're going to get different numbers. So we can characterize that uncertainty with the standard error. So this, if you like, is the error in these numbers. Right? So you remember um, that we could compute a confidence interval for these things by saying, well, the confidence in the interval, we normally have to, in order to be 95% confident, we've got to capture twice the, the standard deviation of these things, which is the standard error. Okay? So a confidence interval for this value here would be 2.83 minus twice this, which would be put 2.83 minus uh, 0.14 uh, up to 2.83 plus 0.14 okay similarly we can do a confidence interval for this one it'll be minus 195 uh, plus 2 times 8 and minus 195 minus 2 times 8 would be your two limits okay um, this last block here is also useful to us and the main thing that's useful is this bit here okay which is the multiple r squared and that is the proportion of variation in body weight explained once we know what the heart girth is right so it's the proportion of variation so essentially what it is is it's the variation explained by the model divided by the total variation the variation explained by the model is the total variation minus the the leftover variation that's unexplained so we'll look at that, into that in a little bit more detail and the last thing that's sort of useful though we won't be using it all that often is the overall p-value and that's um, exp um, answering the question is something in my model useful for explaining body weight okay so you can see the p-value here is very very tiny right it's 10 2.2 times 10 to the minus 16 um, so 15 zeros and then a 2 so tiny tiny um, in this case the only thing we've got in our model is heart girth so it's equivalent to saying is heart girth important and that's also what this p-value here is saying All right so each of these p-values here and each row here is saying is basically testing could this number here the estimate that we get be zero okay now you remember from um, lecture six uh, zero is what we'd expect the slope to be the coefficient of heart girth to be if there was no relationship in the population between body weight and heart girth so if there's nothing no relationship between body weight and heart girth then changing the heart girth wouldn't affect the body weight 
So we'd expect when we fit a, fit a line, it would be flat, right? Because the average body weight wouldn't change as you change the heart width, so it must be flat. Um, but of course, we didn't get flat at all. We got a steep line, right, with a slope 2.83. And so this p-value is just saying, well, how often would you get a slope as large as 2.83 just due to the sampling process, just due to sample to sample variation? And the p-value is really, really tiny, right? In fact, it's the same as this one in this case. Okay, and the same here. So this is basically saying, it, could this term here be zero? So could the intercept term be zero? Um, now this is somewhat meaningless in this case because the, the intercept itself is meaningless. So usually we don't really worry about the p-value for the intercept all that much because in the vast majority of cases it's not useful because the intercept itself is not useful. And in the cases where the intercept is useful, um, zero as a value for that intercept is usually not useful. So if you, you imagine that um, you know you were fitting it to, you were fitting, uh, you were estimating uh, the body, uh, the weight of a lamb, and you, your x variable was age, then your intercept would represent the average age, uh, the average weight when the age is zero, which would be birth weight, right? So at that at that stage, the intercept would be a useful value. Maybe it's four kilos or something for lambs, right, when they're born, on average. Um, but zero is not a useful number to compare it to, right? So the p-value is comparing, you know, could that intercept be zero? But that makes no sense for the context anyway. So even in the context where the intercept is a useful number, comparing it to zero is often not useful, okay? Whereas comparing the slope to zero is useful. So generally we don't worry about the p-value for the intercept, we only worry about the p-value for the, for, the, um, for the slope. Okay, so we'll just uh, sort of reiterate that over the next few slides. So the equation of, um, um, is minus 194.5 plus 2.83, so that's just taken from here. Okay. So for every one centimetre increase in heart girth, we'd have a 2.83 unit increase in body weight, in average body weight. Then the standard error column is the standard error of the estimate, so we can use that to find confidence intervals. So here's that same confidence interval we did before. Right, so confidence interval for, for this number here would be 2.83 plus or minus twice the standard error. Okay, because the twice comes from the 95%, right? If I wanted a 99.5%, then I'd be using three times the standard error. Right, so you change that, that uh, multiplier by how much uh, confidence you want to be. Okay, um, other things. Uh, so the p-value is the p-value for the hypothesis test that the coefficient is zero. Uh, the t-value, which I didn't mention, this here, um, that's just a measure of how many standard errors you are away from zero. So it's just 2.83 divided by 0 0.07 is almost 40. Okay, um, so, so this is just to compute the p-value. The that's all the t-value is used for, right? So it's just to compute the p-value. So we don't really need to care about what this value is. We just look at the p-value. And the other thing I didn't mention is the stars. So what this, the stars do is they categorize the p-value. So you can see this little scale down here, right? If the p-value is between 0 and 0 0.001, then we get three stars. If it's between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01, we get two stars, and so on. Right, so more stars, more better, right? It gives you a, an indication as to how small your p-value is without having to bother looking at the number. Okay, so if you've got lots of stars, then... Um, heart girth is important. Uh, now generally of course you should note down what the p-value is and not just the stars but the order of magnitude is really the only thing that matters. Okay because of course remember the p-value is fairly noisy when we collect a new data set uh, we're likely to get it will definitely get a different p-value um, it'll jump around a bit so order of magnitude is what matters right the exact value doesn't matter so much. Okay so that's asking the question does body weight depend on heart girth? And our conclusion is, of course, it does, right? Um, you know, we'd expect the slope to be zero if there was no relationship there. Our slope was definitely not zero. It was 2.83, and that's um, extremely rare to happen by chance. Therefore, our conclusion would be that the body weight does depend on the hard girth. Now, the multiple R squared, okay, so let's remind ourselves what it is. So 0.8, that's the one we used. We ignore this one, okay? Uh, so this is the one we use, 0.8. So this is 80%. Right, that is the proportion of variation explained. 
So it's the total variance minus the leftover variance divided by the total variance. Right, there's the formula for it. And basically, it's a number between 0 and 1, right? Um, you know, you can see that the, um, if, the residual, if, the, if the model doesn't explain anything, then the top is 0, um, and so r squared is 0. If the model explains all of the variation, then the top would be the total variance, and the bottom would be the total variance, and so you get 1, right? So r squared maximizes out, you know, it's between 0 and 1. Close to 1 means you're explaining everything. Close to 0 is, is you're explaining nothing. So we're explaining 0.8, 80%. Okay, of the variation. And this sort of um, figure kind of explains it, right? So the idea being that um, as you travel along the line here, right, which is which is our model, our linear model is, is describing where that line is, and as you would travel along the line, you explain a lot of the movement and body weight. The scatter around the line is what you can't explain by the model, right? And so that's the variation in body weight unexplained which is about 20% of the variation that you have explained, okay? You can kind of see that by just kind of comparing the numbers, right? Before you know what, um, uh, before you know the equation, the, the um, body weight varies from 50 to 220, 230, maybe it's a sort of 170, 180 units. But once you know the body weight, your variation is only about 30 units, right? So the variation unexplained is 30 out of the 180-ish, which is about 20%. Okay, that's where that number there comes from. So the variation explained must be 80%, right? 100 minus 20. Okay, and this is just uh, relating the p-value of the overall p-value of the model, which is that very last line there, and that's just um, testing, is anything in my model important? And in this model, we only have heart girth, so it's exactly the same as is heart girth important, these p-values are the same, right, they're just written differently. This one has an extra decimal place, but they're the same number. Okay. Once we've got our model, we can then use it for useful things, like prediction. Okay, so the model by itself, first of all, tells us that there's a relationship between body weight and heart girth, but I'm guessing you knew that before we started, right? So that's, you know, that's not an obvious, you know, that's an obvious thing, and we know the answer already. Uh, but it gives us the particular form, that's the advantage, right? And once we have the particular form, we can use it for prediction just by dumping numbers in, right? So if we want to know what the body weight is with the heart girth is 120, we can just dump it in and work it out, right? 145. And we can use predict for this, right? So the predict function takes our model object, just like the summary function took our model object, and it then takes a set of new data, right, which is a data frame, a set of data that has the same columns that we used for the explanatory variable. So in this case, we've got heart girth, and we've just got a single row with it set to 120. And then it does the prediction and gives us the same answer, right? And once we've got that prediction, um, we can also incorporate the uncertainty from the model. So the model doesn't just estimate these numbers, minus 194.5 and 2.83, but it also estimates how much uncertainty is associated with those, and so we can add that uncertainty with a confidence interval or a prediction interval. Now the confidence interval gives you a prediction for the mean, for the average weight of a donkey with the characteristic that you specify. So given lots of donkeys with heart girth 120 centimetres, we'd expect the average of such donkeys in the population to be between 143.4 and 146.5 kilos with 95% confidence. Okay, that's not individual donkeys. We know that the individual donkeys will be scattered around that. It's just for where the line is, essentially. So it's allowing for the, the amount of uncertainty we have in the, the location of the line, which isn't much, right? We've pretty much nailed down where the, where the mean is, where the line is. Um, the un additional uncertainty around the line, i.e. the spread of the individuals, is given by an in a prediction interval, which is much larger. So this incorporates the... Um, the variation around the line. So this would be a 95% a uh, interval for individual donkeys with heart girth 120 centimetres. Okay, so if you want to estimate what the, what the weight of an individual donkey is, what you can say is if it's got heart girth 120 centimetres, then its body weight is somewhere between 124 and 166 kilos. 
you can do two at once or you know 10 at once or 100 at once or a million at once right just by setting up a data frame with all the different heart girths that you want to measure so if you've gone out and measured 10 donkeys measured all their heart girths you pop it into a into a data set where you have a column for heart girth with all the values in it and then you just feed that into your predict function okay so you can get your confidence intervals for multiple measures then you can get similarly your prediction intervals for multiple measures so when we visualize these things right the um, the confidence interval is where the line is so the the black uh, piece here is is our point estimate for the line so that's our our values you know my 195 and uh, minus 195 and 2.83 is giving us that that uh, dark line there um, the dark gray band is the is where the line uh, is our uncertainty as to bit as to where the line is so that's where we think the averages would be somewhere in that band okay and you'll notice that we have less uncertainty in the middle than we do at the ends right and that's just because there's uncertainty in both the intercept which is going to move the line up or down and the slope which is going to tilt it so that's why we have more uncertainty at the ends than we do in the middle because that's the tilting of the line and the tilt tilting of the line the changing of the slope is going to make a bigger effect at the ends than it does in the middle It'll, in fact the uh, uncertainty of the slope will have no effect at all in the middle right because you're just uh, you're just bending the line around the middle um, the wider band here is the prediction interval right so that's a that's incorporate incorporates the uncertainty as to where the line is with the variation that we know we have around the line okay the, the scatter of individuals and so there's 100 data points here and if you count up the ones that fall outside we've got one up there two three four five five out of 100 are outside the prediction interval which is what we'd expect for a 95 percent prediction interval right so 95 percent of the observations of the individual donkeys if you like would be within the prediction interval bands so if you're predicting for an individual you use a prediction interval if you're predicting for the average of a bunch of individuals you use the confidence interval Okay, so the confidence interval is uncertainty in uh, in the mean. Prediction interval is uncertainty in individuals. So it's uncertainty in the mean plus variation of individuals. Okay, so how do we compute all of these uncertainties and things, and what are the assumptions that we make about them, um, and how can we ensure that our um, that those assumptions hold? So essentially, there's four assumptions we make when we're doing linear regression or linear model fitting linearity independence normality and equal variance which happily spell out line as a mnemonic linearity means that the residuals don't depend on x so essentially it means that the, we've we've modeled the trend correctly right a straight line trend makes sense okay and this is the most important thing because what it's saying is that we've correctly modeled the average okay and that's all that the model is doing, right? The whole linear modeling process is modeling the average. And if we get the average wrong, then our model was less useful. So linearity is the most important thing to check. Then we have independence. So we assume that the residuals aren't related to each other in any way. So essentially we assume that um, we don't have clustering in the data. We don't have, for example, we haven't measured the same individuals over time. So when you measure the same individual through time, then you expect the measure today to be kind of similar to the measure yesterday. So they're correlated in some way, right? Um, the assumption that we make is that our leftover after fitting the model, the residuals, are not correlated in any way. They're independent from each other. Another assumption that we make is that the residuals are normally distributed around the trend. So the individual uh, donkeys uh, their body weights are normally distributed around the average body weight given their heart girth. Okay, so this doesn't mean that the body weights are distributed normally. It just means that once you've accounted for heart girth, the leftover, the um, the variation we haven't explained is distributed normally, and those are two different things. Uh, the last thing is that these equal variation, so that the residuals have constant variation. So that means that the variation doesn't change as we change the heart girth. Okay. Um, usually what happens is if linearity is good, then all of these other ones tend to be okay as well, except possibly independence. Okay, Linearity is the most important thing. That ensures we get the average right. 
As long as linearity holds, then we're okay for averages, regardless of the rest of these things. Okay, what might happen is if linearity holds, but maybe independence or normality doesn't hold, then what happens is that the standard errors might be a bit wrong. So your conclusion from p-values p might be a bit small, so your conclusion from p-values might be a bit off. Your uncertainty is wrong, but your averages are okay. All right? So that's why linearity is most important, because it's telling you whether the average is okay. The rest of them is just telling you about whether your characterization of standard errors is okay. So um, the consequences of this is if, if all of these assumptions are met, then um, we know lots of stuff about how alpha and beta are distributed, and so we can compute things like the standard errors, and we can compute things um, like the p-values. That's essentially all, all you need off that slide, okay? So linearity is the most important. Does the form of your model equation make sense? Then the rest of them are le less important. In particular, normality is hardly ever important at all, um, mostly for prediction um, intervals of individuals. Okay, if you're just predicting means, normality really doesn't matter. Um, and the other two, again, um, basically standard errors might be wrong. So how do we test these things? Well, we test them using diagnostic plots. So what we do is we fit a model to the data, I assume the model is the correct form, fit the model to the data, then we pull out the residuals and we take a look at them and see whether the residuals um, satisfy those conditions. And we do that using plot. So plot on your model object will give you four diagnostic plots. Of those four, only one of them is really much use in terms of assessing the model diagnostics, so in terms of assessing linearity, independence, normality, and equivariance. Another one's kind of useful for a different purpose, okay? So we'll look at, the, uh, we'll look at those, the two that are most important, um, and we'll just quickly gloss over the other two. So this is the first one, which is residuals versus fitted value. So along the x-axis, you have the fitted value, so that would be the estimated body weight, and on the y-axis, you have the residual. And this allows us to, to assess linearity. And what you notice here is that we have a curve through the data. So try and see the curve without looking at the red line, which is obviously curved. But instead you look at what the average y value is as you move across. So you can see here that the average y value of these points here is above this dashed line. But then it moves it down a bit and then it goes back up a bit again. Okay, so I'm sort of tracing that red line, um, pretending it, it's not there. I'll show you how to get rid of it later. Okay, so that, if you see a, a curve there, then that's not what you want. What you want is it to be flat. Okay, so linearity holds if you have flat. So if essentially the residuals are equally scattered above and below this dotted line here, which is, represents an average of zero. <clears throat> so that's linearity. There should be no, um, no trend present, no curve present. Equal variation then is the amount of scatter around that trend. So whatever the trend is, in this case it's curved, um, you can see that we start off with a small amount of variation and it gets bigger as we go across, right? So the points are fanning out. And these things typically happen at the boat at the same time. So if you, if you see a curve there, right, linearity doesn't hold. That's the most important thing. It's the thing you need to fix first. But often at the same time, what will happen is that it'll be fanning out. So you'll get this sort of shape here, okay? When things fail like this, like they have in this case, then... Um, we need to fix it in some way with some sort of a transformation. So what we do is we change the scale of the y and x variables, say using a log transformation. We look at, you know, log of body weight versus log of heart girth instead of body weight versus heart girth. And the idea is that on those scales, we get straight lines, okay? So here's just an example. Here's some, some data on the left, okay, um, that we're fitting a straight line to. And this is a perfect fit, i.e. these are data that are distributed um, according to um, what we'd expect, so they're normally, no, uh, the residuals are independent, normally scattered around the regression line um, and a straight line holds, and this is the residual plot that we expect. So this um, sort of little app here just allows you to get a feel for what is normal on the residuals versus fitted plot. So if we just click new data set, all of the things you're seeing in this panel here are the things that you would expect if everything holds. So you can see that sometimes we get a slight curve down maybe, and sometimes you'll get a slight curve up, and sometimes you'll get, you know, a bit more scatter at this end than this end. This is all completely normal. This is all exactly what you'd expect. You can see you've got more scatter here than you do in the middle, maybe. 
but this is all it, nothing wrong with us perfect here's maybe you've got a bit of a curve okay but actually you know the data is actually generated from a perfect normal distribution so this is actually completely fine okay so you've got to be a little bit careful when you assess the residuals versus fitted plot um, just pick out things that are really bad essentially so if you look at it and kind of it causes you to uh, you know jump a bit or you know something leaps out at you and says hey this doesn't look right then maybe you, you should be worried if you look at it and go oh is that okay uh, maybe then don't worry at all it's probably fine okay so to show you what bad things look like let's add some curvature okay so these are obviously bad right um, so perhaps less extreme okay so these are where we have a little bit of curvature okay you can see some curvature here and you should start being a little bit concerned right we're not fitting the trend well and the other thing I want to point out is that it, the graph of the data looks actually not too bad right the straight line actually fits here not too bad it's hard to see the curvature here but it's very easy to see the curvature here so it's just something to be aware of. This is the purpose of the fitted versus residuals plot, is it allows us to assess the trend much more clearly than the original data. Okay. So, you know, we've got some curve here. It's not too bad. I wouldn't worry too much. Um, some of them are more extreme than others. Right here, I've got some curvature. Maybe I want to look into it a little bit further. Okay. That's the idea. And a transformation often fixes this. So if I do a log transform, add a bit of non constant variance, then you can see that, you know, if I don't do the transformation, I've got some curvature present and some fanning, right, non-constant variation. If I transform the variables first, then things fix themselves, okay? So have, have a play with what you expect with normal, which is where you have no curvature, non-constant variance, no transformation. This is all normal stuff. And then add a bit of curvature, a bit of non-constant variance, and see what you t get there. That's abnormal stuff just to give you a feel for what you'd expect. So in general, when you look at it and it really doesn't, you know, and it's sort of doesn't jump out at you too badly, then it's probably okay. Uh, the next one you get is the uh, normal QQ plot. So it's um, this one here. Generally, my advice is just to ignore this, okay? The third one we get is a scale location plot. Again, ignore it, okay? There's stuff written about it if you want to know what it is, but... Uh, the last one doesn't assess model assumptions instead it assesses influence so what it's looking for is is your model equation that you've computed right you you, you know your your coefficients that you've that you've worked out your minus 195 and um, 2.83 are they too dependent on just one or two points right so do you have some outliers in the data that are influencing the shape of your model okay and so what this does is you have these bands down here, right? So you've got two, two measures. You've got your influence across here. Uh, sorry, you've got your uh, leverage across here and you've got your residual across here. And um, you don't want to be past these bands, right? So these dashed dash lines, you don't want points up in the top right or the bottom right. If you do, then those are influencing your model quite a bit, okay? So basically, um, points can be extreme in two ways. You could have extreme X values, so extreme heart girths. Okay. Um, they're going to have high leverage because they're right at the ends of the line and they can pull down on the line quite strongly. Right. You think about um, the principle of the lever, right? When you open a door with, that has a lever to open it, if you use the very end of the lever, you can open the door much more easily than if you, if you try and open it right next, to the, right next to the sort of the shaft that the lever is sitting on. Right. It's really hard to open the door. Um, to move the door handle but it's really easy at the end that's why we have door handles with levers right um, the other way that they can be extreme is that could is that observations could have an extreme body weight given the heart girth right so given the heart girth they might have they might be really light or really heavy so they would have a big residual right they'd be a, a large distance away from the average um, body weight for that for that uh, quantity and the bad points are ones that have both so they have a high leverage and high residuals and, and therefore they're, um, they're extreme. So here's an example, we have some normal data here with a model fit and I'm going to add a new point. So this is what the residuals versus leverage plot looks like. So here's the sort of the, the, um, the bands that I don't want to go across. So I don't want points up here and I don't want points down here. As long as all my points are in the middle here, I'm happy. So if I add a new point that's maybe, um, 
maybe has an extreme X value, then you'll see that it has high leverage, like it's far across here, but it doesn't have a big residual, right? I put it where I would expect the line to go through anyway, so it hasn't affected the model fit at all. Similarly, if I put it down here, then I get high leverage, but it hasn't moved the line at all because I put it essentially on the line anyway, right? So it has a large leverage, but not a large residual. Similarly, if I put it in the middle, but have a large um, residual, so it's very far away, it's a really odd donkey, given the heart girth, I'd expect it to be way down here, but it's really strange. Then it has a large residual, but it's not really affecting the model fit at all. All it's done is shifted the line a tiny little bit. Hasn't changed the slope at all though, has it? Right? This one's changed the slope a tiny little bit. Um, but mostly it has a big residual, but because it doesn't have leverage, it hasn't affected the shape. So the bad points are ones that have big leverage and big residuals, such as this one here. Right, so you can see that I've changed the model fit quite a bit just by adding that one fit, that one point. Right, so with that one point, I get the red line. Without it, I get the black line. Okay, so because that point has changed the model fit a lot, I'm in danger territory. And similarly up here, right, danger territory. So whenever you have points up here, what it's saying is that your, your, um, the equation that you've computed, um, this point is contributing to that equation a whole, a whole heap more than all the other points. So you've got to be careful because your conclusions that you're making based on your data are being influenced by that one point more than all of the others. So what you should do in that circumstance is remove that point and refit. Okay? So that's what that one there is. Uh, putting at. So in summary, when we're looking at the model diagnostics, we'll see this again in the lab, uh, what we look at is the residuals versus fitted plot first, right, the very first plot you get, and what you're looking to see is do you have curvature or increasing scatter from left to right. If you do, then linearity is broken and you need to fix it. So we'll look at how to fix that with say a log transform or something. Um, once you fix the linearity and the first one holds, right, so you look at the residuals versus fitted plot and you're, you're okay with it, then you can look at the residuals versus leverage plot, the last of the four, to see whether your um, assumptions are just being based on one or two points. And if they are, then maybe maybe try removing them and refitting your model to check that your uh, conclusion isn't based on just those one or two observations. That's it.